music, science, it's the Amoeba People Podcast. Greetings and welcome to the Amoeba People Podcast, the show where science and music collide, fortuitously forming a cosmic confection for your ears. My name is Ray Hedgepeth, the singer-guitarist of the unquantifiably nerdy science rock band, the Amoeba People, and today's episode is all about the amazing Marie Tharp. No offense to Stan Lee fans, but the amazing Spider-Man's got nothing on Marie Tharp. The cartographer who not only was the first to successfully map the ocean floor, but also by discovering a rift valley at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean caused a revolution in science and shifted our understanding away from the old view of a static, boring old ocean floor that never moved to a dynamic system whereby the entire crust of the planet is broken into various sized slabs or plates which move as a result of the heat from Earth's molten interior. Yes, Marie's discovery led to the development of plate tectonic theory, which now, more than half a century later, is the foundation of Earth science. And in addition to our subject, the amazing Marie Tharp, our guest today is author Hallie Felt, whose book, Soundings, The Story of the Remarkable Woman Who Mapped the Ocean Floor, is the definitive biography of Marie Tharp, and such an incredible read. Sometimes science books can be you know, difficult, or uh, they can be slow, or they can be hard to understand, but Soundings is swift, informative, exciting, and never, never once lost my attention. I loved, loved, loved this book. And so I hunted Hallie Felt down. It, it, it took some some sleuthing, but I eventually got a hold of her and she agreed to be on the podcast and gave me this incredible interview all about the process of how she went through getting all this incredible information about Marie Tharp because people know so little about her. So I can't wait to share that interview with you. We'll also be breaking down our song, Girl Talk, from our latest album, The Fossil Record, a song all about the amazing Marie Tharp, and whose title comes from the fact that when Marie first presented her idea to her male colleague that there was a rift valley at the bottom of the ocean floor, his comment was, this is nothing but girl talk. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. So, um, And and the idea for that song uh, came from an, a female earth science professor who contacted us and loved our song, Continental Drift, about Alfred Wegener, but asked if we were familiar with Marie's story, and we were not. So she sent some articles, and I read them, and I was immediately intrigued, and I could not believe that this amazing story was not better known. So we decided to write a song that would hopefully draw more attention to Marie's amazing story and the work that she did uh, that contributed to the development of plate tectonic theory. So let's jump right in and learn a bit more about the amazing Marie Tharp. Okay, we're going to break down our song, Girl Talk, and as we do, ladies and gentlemen, there's some special guests here in studio. It's the Meebs. What's up? Hey. Dustin Jordan, our drummer, and Ryan Mosley, bass player of the Amoeba People. Say hi, guys. Wait, hey. which one am I? I don't know who. <laughs> Dustin Jordan here? No, that's me. Oh, uh, you know, that's I'm true. Sorry. We've never had all three of us on the mics at once during a podcast, that's so we true. should introduce ourselves one at a time. What cool. a crime. I know. So, uh, of course, you guys know I'm Ray Hedgepath. Dustin? I am Dustin Jordan, drummer of the Amoeba People. Thank you very much. And Mr. Mosley. I am Ryan Mosley, bass player of the Amoeba People. He's lying. <laughs> I'm just <kidding. laughs> Curse us. <laughs> we caught him. We caught him. Foiled again. And this is pretty cool, though. This is the first time we've actually broken down a song with all three of us here. Yeah. We've done it separately before, but not with all three of us. So what an opportunity breakdown. for yeah. the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> the Seriously. Three-way breakdown, Meba style. <laughs> lucky you guys. Yeah, yes, this is uh, this is uh, your lucky day, listener. Okay, so we're going to start with, uh, with the drum. So, Dustin, we're going to start with you. Let's... Oh, man, thank you. <laughs> Such an honor, <laughs> He's huh? He's honored. Big time. <laughs>
Now, you know, when you come up with a beat like that, are you listening to, so often I come to the guys like with an idea, guitar, vocal and stuff. Are you thinking, okay, I'm going to kind of come up with something that matches that guitar part? Or are you thinking, oh, let me come up with the drum part and then these guys will play off of it? Or like, like, where do you start when you come up with something like that? Well, your your guitar line I thought was kind of reminiscent of a Curtis Mayfield line, mm-hmm. which is "Who's that lady?" Right. So yeah. So it's yeah. like, oh, what if you put like this cool flange, or you know, just like listen to the guitar part of "Who's that lady?" Mm-hmm. It's like really sweet, great sound, um, and I'm a lifetime fan of funk drumming. So mm-hmm. when I think funky drums, I think James Brown, mm-hmm. killer drummer, great great beats. Uh, just iconic. Mm-hmm. He, and, and when people think of the Amoeba people, they think James Brown. Obviously. 100%. We <laughs> get that a lot. Big tie-in. Yeah. But, but I mean, but we do kind of genre hop. So, yeah, I like, I mean, and we all love funk music. I mean, For there's sure. no question. So If you don't, there's something really wrong with you. I completely Absolutely. agree. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. in, in the mythology of the Amoeba people, as we're coming from the planet Crouton, I mean, if you came from another planet, you would probably think the greatest music on the planet is funk music yeah. so, or, or something along those lines. Odds are yeah, definitely in favor of that conclusion. Well, speaking of bringing in the funk, uh, yeah. let's bring in Ryan Mosley on the bass yeah. here. Oh, oh, yeah. Funkiest Please. Amoebes you know. Like uh, so, so you just kind of like um, listen to all the because I noticed so many of your little licks in there. You, like, do you listen just very carefully to what Dustin's doing, and then for that's sure, yeah, where a lot of that stuff comes from. Absolutely, yeah. When we were recording this, uh, yeah, I would just kind of sit down and have Dustin's drums playing, and I kind of had an idea of the structure of what I wanted to do, but I would really kind of try and dial in with you know the appropriate beats to adjust my notes to and all that good stuff. But yeah, definitely playing off of a guy yeah. like Dustin is just tremendous and Ryan and I have played together for a very long time too. yeah before so we, the Amoeba kind of people built a, before yeah. the Amoeba people these guys were in a couple bands together right mm-hmm. you know, yeah, at least so. a couple one yeah. that was very funky oh okay very yeah. funky what was that band it was called it was the future, future ancients. ancients okay yeah. yeah okay and now we're gonna bring in uh, the percussion that uh, Dustin did along with the the bass and the drums, which are already there. But uh, we got some bongos, right? And some shakers. Bongos and shakers, yeah. yeah. All right, let's check it out. How did you learn so many percussion instruments? Well, I kind of got lucky. Uh, many years ago, I met a guy named Ray Bonda, who's like a death metal drummer, but uh, his dad and uncle are known as the Bonda Brothers, mm-hmm. who his his godfather is Pancho Sanchez. Oh, wow. And he kind of showed me the ropes when it came to hand percussion a mm-hmm. long time ago, uh, thankfully. And... I kind of just took it from there. Just took off from there. Wow, Pancho Sanchez. Wow, that's like... Legend. That's yeah. like the mm-hmm. Olympus of uh, hand percussion right totally. there. Totally. Yeah. I got very, very lucky. That's yeah, and he's a really man. kind and sweet dude. All right, and now it's time to bring in Ryan Mosley's Woo! BGVs, Ooh. which actually the BGVs kind of, the background vocals take over the chorus too, you know, because they interplay against my voice yes. uh, doing the quote-unquote rap part. Yes. <laughs> so... Yeah. Uh, um, let's just listen to him first and let's, let's, then we'll talk. Can't wait. Oh, and I almost forgot. This is where we'll bring in the guitar as well.
remember being in here going, <laughs> and you were like, because <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan, I got it. So when I do background vocals, one of the things I struggle with is the timing. Like, hmm. how in the world do you get your timing so precise like that? Because my background vocals, if I do more than one track, inevitably it's going to be off by a hair. I don't, you know, when I got Dustin's drums just like beating into my brain, it's, I can't go wrong. You know what I mean? You're like, scoring major points with me right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet, you guys. Aww. <laughs> so it must just be with you. It's just kind of natural. Then I think your timing is just really good. Obviously, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just answering honestly. So. <laughs> what can I say? Okay, now, um, you know, I'm usually in control of uh, the mixing and uh, the editing here, but um, what we're going to do is I'm going to play the the very first recording of the first idea I had for Girl Talk so that Ryan and Dustin can uh, poke some fun at me. Yes. That's a horrible idea, Ray. <laughs> so uh, here it is. I was uh, in the, the bathroom at work, and I was like, i got to record this idea. Here we go. Huh? Nice timing. Yeah. Oh. Sounds good in there, huh? That sounds good. It's a nice beatbox. I mean, <laughs> out of all the restrooms I've heard uh, song demos recorded in, this why do you have me do any beatboxing, okay. man? <laughs> yeah, together. Yeah, that, so that's Ooh. that's the first idea, the first uh, kernel of the idea for Girl Talk. I was at work, uh, you know, I teach, uh, and this is the staff bathroom. I needed a spot to go record the song, and I was like, dude, it sounds great in the bathroom. Got my vote. It's a good, good sounding room. The sounds genesis great. of a yeah. beautiful song. All right. Well, you I think actually, we found our new studio. <laughs> <laughs> so later that day, then when I was driving home in my car, I um, was recording more of the idea, trying to flesh the idea out a little bit more. So um, let's uh, let's hear a little bit of that. Too. There's more. There's more. But oh, in the car, there's more. <laughs> Oh, wow. So we already have the... Yeah, see, the interplay between the high vocals and the low vocals is already there. Oh, he part. came up with the little uh, hastening of the, the accents there. Yeah, already. Man. Nice. That's what a huge development between bathroom and van. Yeah. <laughs> I, that, yeah, this probably was my minivan at the time. I had a minivan then. I don't have you it did, anymore. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this would have been in the minivan that this song was uh, partially written. And as always, we will hear the completed version of Girl Talk at Woo! the end of this episode. That'll be yeah. fun. But you know what, guys? This has been fantastic because how often Absolutely. do we get to do this? And uh, here we are. It's a all lot three of us. fun. Thanks Very for cool. being here. It's great to see Thank you guys. You. Yeah, man. It's, it's your house. You <laughs> Don't thank us. <laughs> Um, all right. We've been eating all your food yeah, when you were watching. All right. Seriously, though, guys, thanks for uh, for coming out hey, and um, you, man. and making this episode special. Good to see you, fellas. Loved extra, it. Extra special. Hello? Hello. Is this Hallie Felt? Yes, it is. You're kidding me. Author of Soundings? The story of the remarkable woman who mapped the ocean floor? That's me. Incredible. Pow! Hey! Boom! Explosion! Okay, this is big shot Hollywood director Michael Bay. Oh, hi. Hallie, I gotta tell ya, I loved your book so much that I want to make it into a movie, okay? Really? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes! So here's my idea, okay? Marie Tharp. Okay, she's slaving away, mapping the ocean floor, all right? She catches wind of a research vessel that's about to set sail with the goal of gathering the very data that she's going to need to complete her map of the ocean floor. Pow! Bill crash! Explosion, okay? So, she disguises herself as a crew member because women aren't allowed on boats in those days due to an ancient superstition. And when they're about to turn back, okay, she demands that Bruce, her old pal, take the ship to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where she's convinced there's a rift valley, okay? That she yanks off her wig, and he sees that it's Marie, okay? And he's simultaneously angered, but also infatuated, okay? And in her hand, she's holding a thermal detonator! I'll blow this entire vessel to smithereens! Bruce, he calls her bluff. He says, go ahead, set off the thermal detonator! Okay? But then she does, and then the research vessel is blown to smithereens. Pow! Little crash! The helicopter descends, 
into the flaming rubble of the vessel and drops a rope ladder. Um, yeah, that sounds interesting, but I'll need to get back to you on that. Bye. <laughs> Yes? Hello, is this Halle Felt, author of Soundings, the story of the remarkable woman who mapped the ocean floor? Yes? This is legendary filmmaker Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog? Of course I know who you are. Upon reading your book, I found myself consumed by a single purpose, and that was to transform your book into a feature film. That's very flattering. Yes, I am quite aware. Come with me now, as we travel together, deep beneath the ocean's waters, to the Rift Valley itself. The camera slips down into the abyss of that crevasse, and my unmistakable narration begins. We stare into the vacant, gaping moor of the Rift Valley. It is blind and mute to our joys and sufferings. It moves by nature's hand, unaware that we are even here, with our loves, our desires, our craving for more knowledge about its implications. It simply asserts itself, speaking in a physical language we may never fully understand. Uh, I'm flattered, but I'm going to have to think about it. Nonsense. Wait till you see what happens in the third act. Who is it? Oh, uh, sorry. Is this Hallie Felt? Yes. Author of Soundings, the incredible book about the amazing Marie Tharp? Yes. Hi, this is Ray Hedgepeth of the Amoeba People. Okay, is that a non-profit? <laughs> well, we're a science rock band, so I guess the answer to that is yes. Anyway, I think your book is amazing and inspiring, and I think the whole world should read it, and we wanted to write a song about Marie Tharp. Okay. So, do we have your permission? You didn't need my permission to write a song about Marie. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess this was just an excuse for me to tell you how fantastic your book is. Thank you. But there is one thing about the song. Oh, what's that? Make sure it rocks. Oh, it will. And above all else, make it groove. Hallie, we will not disappoint you. Last name Tharp, first name Marie with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor using sonar data from the Second World War. But she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research... If you've heard the story of plate tectonics, odds are that you heard it the way I did, that there was a German scientist named Alfred Wegener who proposed the continental drift hypothesis in 1915 with the publication of his book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans. His idea of continental drift was rejected and even ridiculed in its day. Then Wegener died in 1930 while on a meteorological expedition to Greenland, and it wasn't until the 1960s that new evidence arose that brought Wegener's idea back from the dead. The scientists responsible for this, people like Harry Hess and J. Tuzo Wilson, among others, proposed that the Earth's crust was broken into massive plates that moved slowly over time. And the evidence for this was growing all the time and led to a simple conclusion that, like Wegener had originally proposed, continents could actually drift over time. But what has traditionally been left out of that version of events is what exactly was the evidence that helped Hess and Wilson and others come to this conclusion. It turns out that that evidence was provided by a quiet but stubborn cartographer named Marie Tharp. And that stubborn part is important because when she finished her map of the Atlantic Ocean floor and concluded that there was indeed a rift valley running the entire length of the ocean floor... She stuck to her conclusion even after her colleague Bruce Hazen, who she would continue to work with for decades, called her idea Girl Talk. But eventually, even Bruce came around, and so did the scientific community. And my guest, Hallie Felt, is largely responsible for putting Marie's story on the map. <laughs> Get the pun? Her book, Soundings, has created a conversation about women in science, and particularly the role they played in the male-dominated research facilities of the past, like Lamont, where Marie worked. And this book has shown a light on the fact that one of the biggest discoveries in the history of Earth science, if not the biggest discovery, was made by a woman. So I began by asking Hallie Felt how she first heard Marie's story and what sparked the interest in turning Marie's incredible life saga into a book. So 
So I was in graduate school when I read about Marie in the New York Times. Um, it was my first year. It was my, well, I hadn't quite started my second semester. Um, and I read about her in the, uh, the New York Times is a roundup every year of the folks who have died in the last year who are notable. And uh, that's how I got interested in her. You know, as a first year MFA student, um, you're always kind of thinking about what you're going to be writing about. And so I was trying to think about like, what was the spark? And that's at least part of it that I, I was always thinking about, what am I going to write about next? Um, but there are always tons of things that you can write about next. So I think as far as like what was in my background, um, I was certainly, I was in the nonfiction program at the University of Iowa. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to write nonfiction. I, I, you know, I wasn't really that writing fiction wasn't <laughs> really an option. Um, so it was certainly that. And even though it was a true story, um, there were sort of these, like the idea, like just thinking about the ocean floor was fantastical, right? Like you can't really, I mean, you can, like if you're talking about outer space, um, get much further from our everyday experience than the ocean floor. And there's also this idea of like outer space that everybody thinks about all the time. But I refer to, I think in the book and when I'm talking to people, like giving talks and stuff, so this idea of inner space, which is the ocean floor, um, and that it is so much less studied than outer space, and it's actually our own planet, which is really interesting. So I think that's part of what got me really fascinated. And then her as a character, um, just she just seemed really compelling, and there was something about someone who, like, you know, I'd never learned about her in school, and I'd never thought about mapping the ocean floor before, and I had no idea that she was the person who basically led to... Her Her discoveries were what led to the ideas of plate tectonics. So it was all just, like, kind of overwhelming that all of this information, it was stuff that I'd never thought of before. Um, even though, as I talk about in the book, my mom had made maps. Um, she was an illustrator, and she drew maps occasionally uh, for a living. And so certainly that idea of, I've always, my family is artistic, um, but they're also pretty scientific. Um, one of my aunts is a botanist. Um, the other one is an avid gardener. She used to be a copy editor for uh, Organic Gardening Magazine. And so that's always been a part of my life too. I don't think I really acknowledged that scientific part for a really long time. And it really wasn't until I read about Marie Tharp that I started thinking about science again. I hadn't thought about it since I was probably in middle school and I was really fascinated by Ebola. <laughs> um, and I certainly the scientific education that I was getting in school was not talking about things like that. And it, I, the message I was getting was that science was not for me. Um, I was a girl and I was poor. So it didn't feel accessible to me. Um, but reading on my own books like The Hot Zone and Laurie Garrett's, like I was the middle schooler who was reading Laurie Garrett's The Coming Plague, which is like three inches <laughs> thick and was fascinated by it. But at the same time, if somebody asked me if I was into science, I would have said no, because I was thinking in a formal way in school. And if you've listened to other episodes of this podcast, whether we've been talking to scientists or artists, or in this case, an author, the same theme keeps popping up. This idea of, you know, I wasn't necessarily a science person, but then I was drawn to this particular aspect. And I'm really hoping myself, even as an educator, that we can start uh, breaking free of this concept uh, that seems to kind of be enmeshed in our schools, which is there are science people and then there are not science people. There are the rest of us, right? But the truth is, yeah, there's going to be the science people who are scientists who do that work work. But this idea that, you know, the population at large can't understand our place in the universe, or at least have questions about it that they that want to know or, or have answered, or at least explore, let's, let's get rid of that. I think that is really the key to what it what happened here with Hallie. And one of the fantastic things about this book is the level of detail. But it got me wondering, since people knew so little about Marie, especially prior to Hallie's book, how in the world was Hallie able to gather all this information? Where in the world did it come from? 
I actually, I was studying at the University of Iowa and there happened to be a very small collection of papers. Uh, I forget what the name of the collection was called, but Bruce Hazen grew up in Moline, Iowa. And so uh, someone who had known him uh, in K through 12 had donated this uh, collection of papers to the University of Iowa, which was really strange. Um, so I took a look at those. Um, and so at first it was like, okay, well, there's not a lot of information here. And I started my, um, you know, I had a big piece of butcher paper on my wall and I was trying to sort of get a good timeline uh, of her life. That's really what I usually try to do when I'm working on something. And it was really, really sparse. And so I thought, well, I'm going to write a kid's book that's maybe sort of fictionalized about her because I can't find the information. Um, at some point within that, like, winter, spring of 2007, I discovered that her papers, so it's called the Hazen Tharp Collection at the Library of Congress, um, were at the Library of Congress. And so I decided to go there that summer. And uh, just spending, I think I was there for two weeks that, that first trip, um, I realized that it had to be a book uh, at that point because there were at that time over 40,000 pieces of material in the archives. Um, and there are even more now because that was before her house got cleared out, which is, is a story that I tell in the book. Um, so going there just totally was transformative because not only was I blown away by how much material there was, but I also learned from talking to the librarians there that no one else had, no other researcher had really gone through the collection. That it was, it had really over the past few years just come to them. And it was still, I think I talk about this in the book, it was still totally unorganized. So I was going through like liquor store boxes that had come directly from Marie Tharp's house, which was just like the most amazing experience, but also... In a way, it was good because I was not trained as an archivist, um, and that was not the kind of research I was used to doing. I was more used to interviewing people um, and doing, like, database research. So I taught myself, basically, and um, and it was really fun. It was, like, kind of going on a treasure hunt because every box that I found, I had no idea what I was going to find. Um, so that's really when I knew that I had a book and that, a book was po even possible before that it there just wouldn't have been enough information to tell a true story in the way that um I was trained as you know I was trained as a journalist so in in the way that I would have wanted to tell it um so I really needed that stuff at the Library of Congress for sure. That's where the, I think that was the turning point. Okay. So she's trained as an author, as a journalist, but you can see what's happening here. It's essentially the work of a scientist. Maybe I'm, you know, making a stretch here, but the fact is she's gathering her research. She's gathering data. She's doing the preliminary work that will allow her to you know, tell the story of Marie, the way that scientists gather information on a particular topic before they explore it perhaps they figure out what they can before they go do a study on it uh, just like we in the amoeba people oh gosh i know i'm throwing us into the mix as if we're even on the same level as an incredible author like hallie or these scientists that do this work but but we we dig in and we we learn this stuff and then we try to emerge with a catchy little tune that kids will want to sing along to and even college students it turns out Okay, but I digress. At some point, it had to have occurred to Hallie that she was on to an incredible story here, a big story. And I, I asked her about that moment where she that, that realization just kind of settled upon her that, oh, this is a big deal. I was so, I mean, she she's, it was like getting to, go, I, I, I don't know what to compare it to, but like, I don't know, like Marie Curie, like if you if you got to go through boxes of stuff that had just been taken out of Marie Curie's house, like everything was exciting, like receipts were exciting. And I tell my students that when they're go when they're doing archival research, like you might not think that this particular piece of information is important. Uh, but receipts actually turned out to be super important to me because they allowed me to figure out dates of things like, okay, so she was in, uh, she was in Manhattan on this particular day, or she was, 
uh, in France or whatever, or she got the dog groomed. Like that stuff actually turns out to be really important. And I found it fascinating that she mentioned Marie Curie in the same breath as Marie Tharp, because uh, I noticed that Hallie, in going through all these receipts and these little details, she is essentially Marie's curator. That's that's as good as the jokes are going to get on this episode. I'm really sorry, but I had to share it. To be able to experience that, and I was young enough to have the stamina uh, to just work all day at the Library of Congress, go home, sleep, and then come back and work all day long again. It was pretty clear that no one else was really interested in this story, and um, it, it felt like I had to do I mean certainly I could have not done it but it felt like I had to do it and I wanted to do it um and that is so amazing and and that whole process of of you know kind of digging into these archives and and kind of creating a story almost from scratch of course the story is there but to find all the strands and the components it reminded me of the engineers at Lamont where uh where Marie Tharp worked and uh and I asked her if she felt any kinship with those engineers, how they were they were building scientific instruments from scratch. You know, they knew what they wanted to study, but the the mechanism of how to get that information they had to develop on their own. And of course, I saw a parallel, and Hallie maybe didn't see a parallel with the engineers so much as she did with Marie. Um, I don't think I felt a kinship with the like the engineers and machinists that. Lamont, uh, I was certainly really interested in what they were doing because, of course, like it's fascinating to think about. Like, so a, no, a whole new branch of, of science is sort of being opened up, and of course, you have to develop new tools. Um, and I think it's it's. I was uh, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks had come out in twenty ten or two thousand nine. I can't remember, um, but I I was really interested in the way that uh, Rebecca Sklut talked about the those first attempts to create a uh, cell culture and um so that felt really similar to what some of these uh, folks were doing in trying to develop tools to study the ocean floor um i i didn't feel a sense of kinship with them per se um i felt i, I certainly felt a sense of kinship with marie because uh you know basically she was my ocean floor right like she was trying to study something that she would never be able to interact with firsthand uh using sparse data and she had to figure out what to do in the places where she didn't have data and so obviously that's why the book well i hope obviously that's why the book is called soundings um dang best metaphor ever marie tharp was her ocean floor Oh my God, that's incredible. I mean, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Man, I'm really sorry. The puns keep getting worse and worse, and uh, that, that part's on me. But one thing I really wanted to know after reading the book, you know, Marie was such a mysterious, enigmatic, kind of quiet person in real life, and and I wanted to know how Hallie got her personality down on the page so well. I'm not entirely sure how I did it. I mean, it was hard. Um, I obviously couldn't speak to her, so I had to rely on other people's question, the other question, the questions that other people had asked her, um, either oral historians or other journalists, because um, there were a few people who uh wanted to write books about her and and also Bruce and ended up not doing that so luckily I had their transcripts but it's also frustrating to be in that position as a writer to not be able to ask your own questions um her personality was I think really difficult to get on the page um and you know the people who knew her do say that I did a really good job of that so I feel thankful that they were able to give me that feedback um but she's she's really complicated, right? She's somebody who, in a certain way, seems to fade into the background, but at the same time, did manage to peek through history, right? And and you know, obviously, she was notable and memorable enough for the New York Times to include her um, in in their list of people who had died in two thousand six. So there was something about her that people were interested by. Um, I think I just tried to pick out what seemed to be the most pivotal moments in her life and get those on the page and get, you know, a pretty good um, depiction of the way that she talked about those moments also on the page. 
So there's probably a, a, a pretty good deal of skewing towards the way she viewed things in retrospect because most of the interviews that I was reading were done towards the end of her life. There were a set that were of interviews that were done in the 70s, um, which was really helpful. But most of them were from the end of her life where she was getting a little bit more um, confidence, not the word. She, she was, I think, wanting more recognition for mm-hmm. her work. She was understanding that if she didn't go out there and sort of do her own PR campaign, no one was going to do it for her. No one was going to knock on her door and say, Marie, we know you've done something amazing that deserves an incredible amount of recognition and we want to give it right. to you. She had to, she had to go to the Library of Congress and ask them if they wanted her papers. And, you know, and then that's, you know, that's how we get to here. And, you know, it just seems to me like, I mean, there's no question that the fact that she was a woman in, you know, this line of work and in, in this time period, that, that that was a factor. I mean, having to actually go to the Library of Congress and saying, do you want my papers instead of, you know, them simply coming after her. But there's also this other component that's super fascinating, and that's her personality. And uh, and Hallie talked a bit about um, even reading transcripts of interviews, uh, how Marie was this quiet, kind of almost distant person that maybe also, in addition to her being a woman, made it even less easy for people to reach out to her. Certainly. So if you go and read these interviews with her, she's often not using any sort of words that have to do with emotions. Like she'll, she she very rarely said, and I don't know if ever, you know, I would have to go back and look. That's, it's really interesting. And I don't know if I was aware of this at the time, but she doesn't use words that have to do with emotions. Um, She describes events, right? So she describes uh, the day that she found out that Bruce died, right? But she doesn't say, I was sad, I was devastated, this or that. And so I... There, you know, I didn't ever want to say, especially in the sections where I'm hypothesizing um, about what happened in a particular moment, I never wanted to say, like, in, in first person, I am thinking this or I am feeling this. Um, so it was really difficult to, to, to show exactly what was happening and convey a sense of emotion uh, about the events that happened in her life while not sort of assuming too much, basically. You know, she was very humble, but at the same time, I think was extremely confident in her work and its importance. Um, so yeah, to get the complexity of that kind of person on the pages is, is really hard, especially without seeming contradictory, right? Without seeming like, oh, well, she, uh, she was an important person who felt like, uh, the ocean floor needed to be mapped. But at the same time, she was willing to let this man sort of be the public face of all the work. Well, you could say, oh, well, that's contradictory. But actually, it makes a whole lot of sense because she was not going to be able to go out and get funding, uh, and he could. So it was it was really a, quite a convenient relationship, I think, for both of them. And I do wonder, like, what would happen today if, if she was trying to do the same work today, um, and, and how different maybe her personality would be. Um, I don't think she would need Bruce. Um, of the two, I think she was certainly more intelligent. Um, she was much more of, you know, a dynamic and creative thinker uh, than he was. And I don't think we would remember him at all if not for her. <laughs> to be frank. <laughs> Dang, throwing some shade at Bruce Hazen. Uh, you know, I should take this moment to note that in the song, we refer to him as Bruce Hazen. And we had actually gone back and forth a number of times. Uh, there was a line in the song that said um, she showed it, meaning the map. She showed the map to her colleague, Bruce Hazen. He said, Marie, how could you be so brazen? But uh, then we were watching a bunch of YouTube videos. And as I was, you know, kind of refining the lyrics, most of the pronunciations were Hazen. So I changed it to Hazen from Hazen. And then I come to find out from Hallie that one of her life goals is to make sure that people know his name was pronounced Hazen and not Hazen. Uh, so what can you do, right? Anyway, now let's not forget that uh, Jacques Cousteau 
came along and uh, decided uh, he wanted to uh, see if Marie's map actually accurately mapped the ocean floor. And uh, Hallie talked a little bit about that as well. Let's say the popular narrative about Marie Tharp um, is that there seemed to be the need for uh, validation of her work by a man. Um, Mm -hmm. And that makes me really sad. (laughs) Um, And that's, that's kind of that little tidbit is kind of like her story in a really condensed form, right? That like she was, you know, doing her work and was confident in it and knew she was right. And then, you know, a guy has to come along and validate it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on one hand, I think it's really cool. On another hand, I think it's really sad. (laughs) Now I'm going to be totally selfish here and say, for me, it was super cool to discover the part about Jacques Cousteau, uh, just simply because in the song, it gave us another direction to go in. And of course, we can bring in our friend Todd Foe, who has this amazing French accent, to play the part of Jacques Cousteau. And by the way, he is also our Jacques Cousteau that you see in our music video. And I should mention that it's our friend Genevieve Walther who plays Marie Tharp in that video, and she's fantastic. And uh, with that, our episode is about to come to a close. And of course, I did ask Hallie if she would introduce our song, Girl Talk, and she did us the honor of doing so. But before we go there, I want to say go and buy her book, Soundings. Like me, you will curl up and you will read it from cover to cover Because of the way that she perfectly balances the personal and the scientific, you know, she tells Marie's story, but also there's this context of one of the greatest discoveries in modern science. So I promise you, you will love this book. If you don't, um, of course, there's something wrong with you, but also um, don't complain to Hallie, come to me and complain to me, and then I will convince you why you're wrong. You know, I mean, the, the entire purpose of Hallie's book is to get more people aware of Marie Tharp, just like the purpose of this episode is to do the same thing, as well as the purpose of our song Girl Talk is to get more people talking about Marie Tharp, and by extension, not only recognizing her contribution to play tectonics, but also encouraging girls out there, hey, science is for you. We need you. Hi, this is Hallie Fell, author of Soundings, the story of the remarkable woman who mapped the ocean floor, and this is Girl Talk by the Amoeba People. The song you're about to hear is based on true events. In the early 1950s, Marie Tharp's ideas were dismissed as girl talk. Last name Tharp, first name Marie with an expertise in cartography. Got a job map in the ocean floor using sonar data from the Second World War. But she needed new data to complete her map, so they loaded up a research vessel ASAP. They sailed out on the sea. They didn't let women on the research vessel, so with math making tools, Marie did wrestle. She showed it to a colleague, Bruce Heason. He said, Marie, you got no rhyme or reason. She caused a commotion when she said there was a rift in the valley at the bottom of the ocean. Girl talk. That's what the man said. Yeah, that's what the man said. He called it girl talk. Rejected like that. In two seconds, slide, he called it girl talk. A valley with a rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your so Marie went back to the drawing board. Literally, she had a drawing board. She checked it once and she checked it twice. To be triple sure, she checked it thrice. She took it back and she showed it to Bruce. But this time, he called the truce. He shook his head. He said, Marie, Marie, I think I owe you an apology. Your map is right, yes, I must admit. But I'm worried that this map applies continental drift. They published it anyway. Even though they knew the scientists were bound to say. This ain't nothing but girl talk. That's what the men said. Yeah, that's what the men said. They called it. Rejected like that. In two seconds, I they called it. A valley with a rift applies continental drift. There ain't no place in science for your southern reliance on that girl talk. Still, one man was intrigued. He was a well known scientific celebrity. Jacques Cousteau was his name. 
the expiration was his game. He said, Ha ha ha, he I'll go into the sea. I'll be sure to take Millie's map with me. I'll swim it for the whole world to see. And settle this bubbling controversy. Chocolate blue, how can it be? Ever since when Maurice said it would be. The red folly, every mountain peak. It's enough to make a man sneeze home. He caused a They learned the truth, they called it Goodbye. A valley with a red proof continental drift He changed modern science for the silver reliance on the hills Thank you so much for listening to the Amoeba People podcast. If you like our podcast, please give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, If you want to see our video for Girl Talk, it's up on our YouTube page, the Amoeba People YouTube page. And our friend Genevieve Walther, the amazingly talented Genevieve, plays the part of Marie Tharp. And our good friend Todd Foe plays Jacques Cousteau. And of course, the Amoeba People, we play ourselves. Uh, And it's it's a fun video. Check it out. Um, And thank you, science teachers who have been playing that in your classrooms. We really, really appreciate that. Um, If you want to financially support this podcast, we do have a Patreon page. So you can find us on patreon.com. And don't forget our new album, The Fossil Record, is out. So you can buy that anywhere you get your music. Until next time, everybody, onward!